Greetings, I'm DK Rossner. Welcome back to the TTT News. It is kind of sad that this conversation is timely, but I'm grateful that we can pay educational psychologist Justin Rodriguez and the general manager of the Roots Foundation, M.T. Masolwazi, to speak to addressing school violence. Gentlemen, thank you so much for making the time. And Justin, I want to start with you. Thank you. In terms of your thoughts on the current recorded and unrecorded incidents of violence in schools. Thank you for having me, please, Lee. So I think a lot needs to be done to address this, this ongoing concern. Um, the numbers are increasing. The numbers are alarmingly high. And I still think and, uh, there are a great number of incidences not recorded than those that are, that are actually recorded and displayed publicly, you know? So I think a lot needs to be done. We need to have these discussions. Um, it goes back to a lack of self-control and police is not able to really emotionally regulate and, and act accordingly in a situation. Um, I think it, it's very, very prevalent and something that we definitely need to address. So I'm glad that we're able to have these discussions and try to kind of find a way forward. All right, and I'll ask you for your, for your views on it, please, Timo. Yes, um, again, thank you for inviting me here and glad to be on this program. And as Justin said, yes, it is something we have to continuously discuss and not just, not just discuss, but also try to find solutions to these incidents. And I would like us to look beyond the fights. And I'm glad Justin is here in his capacity as a psychologist because we need to look beyond we're seeing the fights, but then there's more to that. You know, what leads to that type of behavior? We need to really explore, discuss, engage. Persons need to be honest. And I say persons need to be honest. Parents, the school administration, you know, these children were not here for two years, right? And they can't say it. you come out of school after two years and you have this heightened aggression. Something happened over that two year period. Right? And we need to discuss that and you know, engage the children also. But that's something we, we missed the point. We have in these discussions about young people without young people. You know? So that's my take. Thank you so much. And in terms of, you started listing out some, some persons in Tima. So the source of this violence, trauma, uh, one of the things that you do with the Roots Foundation is reach out and engage younger individuals. Are you hearing anything? Are you getting any feedback to what some of these sources may be? So, no. Um, when I spoke with my young persons, right, um, within our space, who are not involved, you know, obviously, in the fight because they're not in school again. And one of them said to me, said, I'm empty. Did they, they do a cognitive assessment on these children before they started school? And he, he's saying that not the Tuesday they came out, but like the week before, weeks before, right? And I want to give this anecdote as to, you know, what we see in. So today I had an incident where I exploded, right? But then that didn't start today. Something happened to me on Saturday, right? That, and then something happened last night in a meeting. So I had all this pent up emotion and then this incident today, and boom, I exploded. Someone will say, Emtima, it's the month of Ramadan. You're supposed to be calm. You know, you're fasting. But I'm also human with my own personal issues, right? So these children were out of school for two years. We don't know what they faced in that two years, right? At home, in the community. How many of them were actually online engaged for that two years, right? Children. People have different learning styles. Online does not cater for all the learning styles, right? So these are DK and the nation. We have time bombs in school that just exploded, right? And it's every day we've seen this explosion, right? Yes, we could say, hey, what's wrong, what's wrong? But we have to go back and really find what's causing that, engage the children, find out the ones who fight in, were they, were they involved in online schooling? How is their home situation? You know, the communities they are from, 
What have they been, what have they been exposed to? All these things we need to find out, you know? Thank you so much. And Justin, I want to bring you in here in terms of like looking at this source and from your vantage point as an educational psychologist, what are some of these things that you're involved in at this point in time? Because uh, is it that you're engaging students, assessing, seeing where they're at, looking at some of the needs? Because we would have heard some conversation from the Ministry of Education looking at different ways that they were going to be engaging students and teachers as individuals, as slightly larger groups and as greater groups, uh, but in your role, where do you fit into that? So in my role as, as a psychologist right now, currently, I am not working with the school system. I'm not working with teachers or students. I would love for opportunities that I can, you know, create programs and, and really connect with these individuals. So what I have been doing in my own capacity, I have a nephew who is secondary school age. Um, he hasn't been involved in the in, in, in the school fights and whatnot, thankfully. <laughs> he knows better than that. <laughs> but um, I have been discussing with him, you know, what has been happening and his perspective, you know, his his opinions on what has been taking place. And um, I have started the, um, creating some programs that I can go into schools and propose, you know, on ways of kind of connecting with students where they are at, based on whatever they're experiencing. There's no one source to determine the cause of their, of their traumas or to, to determine um, the reason that they are behaving the way they're behaving, right? So it's really having an understanding of the individual, being able to sit with the individual, have a, a, a clinical assessment with them, a discussion just to see, you know, where their mind is at, what are their thoughts, what are they feeling at this time? Because those two things contribute to how they will behave and how they will respond in situations. A lot of persons are angry, not just children, just persons on the whole, but secondary school students, obviously, yes, um, they have a number of different things happening. They have their family life, they have their school life, they have hormonal changes. So all of these things happening simultaneously. Um, it's very easy for them to, as we could say, trip off or fly off the handle. But it re what that really means is that they have a lack of self-control, no space between impulse and action. Something happens and you act, you act right away. You're not able to rationalize your thoughts. You're not able to rationalize how you really feel. And all of that now contributes to how I respond to the situation. And persons aren't able to you know, bridge that gap. So I would love to create, um, I would love to go into schools and go, go into these different settings and, and, and propose these different workshops and topics to them, these, these um, session outlines that I have created. Um, because I think it's really important that we meet the children or, or, or the students where they are at to see what they are really experiencing from DLX. And Justin, I want to steal a minute from the, from the second half of the conversation just to ask you to break down a little bit internal regulation. Is it a process? Are there steps? Is it just taking a breath counting to 10? What is internal regulation as you would have used the term earlier? That really works for the individual. It's very specific to the individual. Because to me, my emotional regulation, how I, how I internally regulate and how I manage myself, it might be step back, count to 10. Take some deep breaths and count to 10. Some persons, it might be you go outside and you, you enjoy plants. So you go and you, you engage your plants for just a couple minutes. You, you enjoy a cup of tea. You go and you drink a cup of tea. And that's, that's now something that you use to regroup. That is now your thing that you can turn to um, when you feel overwhelmed, when you feel compromised. That now helps you manage self and kind of connect with self to a certain degree that now I can now rationalize my thoughts. I've taken a step back. I've slowed down my thought processes. I can rationalize, rationalize my thoughts, rationalize how I really feel, and then act most appropriately in this situation. I've now created some space between impulse and action. So I don't just seem to, I don't just seem irrational. I act accordingly in this situation. It's really interesting the way that you talk about if you like plants, you go outside and you deal with plants. But we're in a situation where people are back in school and the right. habits have changed. The ways that you may have been able to do something for the last two years have changed. But we Correct. continue the conversation when we return. We're speaking with Justin Rodriguez and uh, Mtima Solwazi about addressing school violence. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are taking a deep dive into addressing school violence. We're doing so with MT Masol Wazi, Managing Director of the Roots Foundation, as well as Justin Rodriguez, educational psychologist. And MT Ma, there's something that you would have said we have in the discussions. 
We need to go further than the discussions. But the question is also, who are we speaking with? And with that, I want to ask you the importance of marrying policy to best practice while still kind of staying on the ground so that the solution fits the specific situation. And it's not as though, well, uh, this, is a situ this is a solution, it's the magic bullet. But then the person say, well, that's a magic bullet for somebody else, you know, sir. How do we, how, how do we kind of treat with that? So, yeah, I'm just smiling because only recently I was telling someone that there, there is this gap between academia and the streets, right? And I think it's, it's a lack of respect and a lack of understanding. Now, we, we in, in terms of policy, we up here and in our minds, we know what is best. But are we engaging the persons who we want to target these policies to? Right? And I think we have to reach that stage where we engage young people. I've been saying this over and over. DK, we just plan programs for young people without consulting them. Would you like this program? Would you think about this program? Right? At, at Roots Foundation, no program we present. Look, Justin just said that he spoke with his nephew, right? His, his, his relative, 17 years old or something, so Justin? 16, right? correct, yeah, my nephew. He's secondary school age, yes, correct. Right. He spoke with his, his, his nephew, and then he came up with some solutions. But we want to sit in, I'm not attacking anyone, in ministries, in departments, and say, we know what is best for these young people, and we don't even self-understand what they are going through. Also, Right, we love to say, what them young, them young people have no problems. You're living in a parents' house. We have to worry about. But guess what? When we were their age, we had problems. We had things to worry about. How come now, when we are adults, we are saying they don't have things to worry about and they don't have problems? We need to get down on the ground and speak with these young people. Find out what is the problem. What happened? Talk to me. What are you going through? You know, how are you feeling? You know, how much of us do that? Right? A child comes to school late. There is the time you come to school. Your school starts at 8 and you come to school 9. And we don't know what happened between the time that child left home, if they left early, and the time they arrived at school. Right? We need to get down on the ground right? and talk with these young people. Right? and include those conversations in whatever policy because if we are saying this is for them why can't they be involved in the discussion in the planning why some kind of easy hard questions that they ask him but with that though i want to bring you in justin and ask a question speaking to the the psychology of perception versus reality and looking right. at the fact that the teacher or the educator in charge of the classroom physically. That time, we would have spent two years out of the class where you don't have the teacher necessarily viewed as the fount of knowledge from which all information flows. What kind of potential repercussions or ramifications should we be looking at with a return to the classroom where you may have the teacher wanting to say, well, once again, I am the avatar of all information. What, what are some of those <laughs> things we need to be looking at? I think what it really, it really um, goes down to the teacher establishing those boundaries or re-establishing those boundaries for the students in the class. Because, you know, you, the, the, the teachers will give and give and, you know, they, they, will, they will try to be a little more lenient as they can be to just to try to, you know, build that rapport with their students and the students will take advantage of that. You know, they will see this, the, the teacher as not necessarily the authority figure in the classroom. And that could, lead, that could lead to some problems. I think what the teacher needs to do there is really um, enforce those boundaries and reestablish boundaries. Yes, of course, you're not going to be, you don't have to be so authoritarian with it that you are now so uptight and so rigid and so cut and dry. But you can still find ways of connecting with your students, building rapport with your students and, you know, establishing yourself as the authority figure in the room. So I think that is, that is the, important, the important part there that I will, um, I will really pay attention to. And I'm glad you answered it like that because how are you going to be authoritative when Miss I was showing you how to do this team's classroom the other day, you know? Exactly, exactly, exactly. And I think that, that as well, 
kind of give teachers uh, an opportunity to connect with students because the students may have been the ones more tech savvy or more privy to these um, technological you know, dysfunctions when the teachers may be experiencing them. So they might be the ones helping the teachers through these challenges, these virtual challenges that they may be experiencing. And that could have been an opportunity to connect with your students. So now that I have connected, now I'm reintegrated into the classroom. We use that previous, that previously established relationship to now establish boundaries for the classroom setting. All right, thank you so much. And in terms of the three minutes that we have left, roles of parents and guardians, as well as some other suggested strategies. I'll start with you, please, Mtimo. So parents need to well, take responsibility for, for their actions. I'll give an example. Um, we had a meeting last night with a school and parents. And because that parent was dissatisfied with whatever reason, Bell taught obscene language, right, in the meeting. And I took serious offense that I told them. I said, listen, that is not happening here, right? Because we love to speak about youth delinquency, and this is your action, they your, they your, they your behavior, right? So parents must be held accountable. They must take responsibility for their actions, right? And they must hold themselves also accountable for the children's actions. This thing about I do, um, I make the child, I make the child mind, but you help shape that child mind. You help shape that child character. Because you're in a meeting, a parent's meeting, with your child, and you belt out obscene language. So then that child could go to school today and kill Smith and kill Sir. Because why? My mother cussed all last night. You know, you could tell me anything. So that is where parents need to really step up and, and take their role as parenting very, very seriously. If you need help, reach out. Reach out. Ministries, NGOs, reach out if you need that support. It's there. I'll ask you the same question, please, Justin. And I, I will say for parents, I will really say it's, it's integral that they find ways of connecting with their children. So they are, they, are younger, they are young adults. They are humans too, younger humans. So they too will have challenges. When we were, when we were their age, we would have had challenges. And we would have felt at times that because our parents' challenges are um, greater than ours, that they kind of invalidate what challenges we're experiencing at this time and at this age. But they have to find ways of connecting with their children, find out what you're thinking, what you're feeling, how you go about managing your, your stresses and managing these you know, challenges that you're experiencing. Allow their children a space to feel through their experiences in order to heal through their experiences and not dismiss or invalidate the way they, the way they feel because the parent themselves may not feel that way. So I say really um, find ways of connecting with your children so that they understand that, you know, it's okay to feel when I feel. And there's, there are healthy ways of expressing emotions. Even emotions like anger, there are healthy expression of emotion that we can, you know, we can demonstrate. So really finding that, that avenue to connect with your children and understand how I think, how I feel, and how that contributes to the way I behave or respond to situations. Naturally, this is just a drop in the bucket, gentlemen, but thank you so much for continuing the conversation forward. And uh, Justin Rodriguez and Mtima Solwazi, we want to thank you so much, as well as everyone looking at this right now on behalf of our entire TTT News team. I'm DK Rasta. Thank you so much for joining us.